Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. It is March 29, 2017, and I'm Chris Martinson, your host. Today, we're going to be talking with Bradley Birkenfeld, author of Lucifer's Banker, the untold story of how I destroyed Swiss bank secrecy. It's a story of intrigue that will both illuminate what's really going on and almost certainly fan the flames of injustice you may be carrying. From his book's description on Amazon, we learn that as a private banker working for the largest bank in the world, UBS, Bradley was an expert in the shell game of offshore companies and secret accounts that dominate the world of the ultra-wealthy. He wined and dined those clients whose millions of dollars were hidden away from business partners, spouses, and tax authorities. As his client list grew, Birkenfeld lived a life of money, fast cars, and beautiful women. But when he discovered that UBS was planning to betray him, he blew the whistle to the U.S. government. Now, despite working with the government closely to expose a gigantic conspiracy between U.S.-based tax cheats and the giant Swiss bank UBS, the so-called Justice Department went after Mr. Birkenfeld for abetting tax evasion by one of his clients. After spending 30 months in federal prison, he was released and three weeks later received a whistleblower check for $104 million, the largest such check ever from the IRS whistleblower office. Welcome, Brad. It is a real pleasure having you on the program. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for having me on here, and uh, I'm delighted to um, educate and inform your audience so that they get a better idea of exactly what went on and how the American people got screwed by their government. Well, you put all of that in the past tense, so, so let's go into the story and see if, if we can have confidence that that's all in the past or not. Um, but what a story. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, how long were you working at UBS, and uh, how did you get there in the first place? Well, I left the United States where I work in Boston for a uh, large institutional investment management firm called State Street Global Advisors. Mm -hmm. I was a currency trader there for uh, several years. And actually, I witnessed the illegal conduct there, which uh, I outline in my book, Lucifer's Banker. Um, and I went to the FBI in Boston at the time, which was 1994. Uh, this was the same FBI office, by the way, Chris, that uh, was... Um, coddling uh, the mobster Whitey Bulger. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine uh, that FBI office was tainted and corrupt and really nothing happened. Um, so that's where the story starts. So I went over to Switzerland to get my MBA in international finance. And when I did that, I then moved from investment banking into private banking, which Switzerland's known for. And I was hired by Credit Suisse in Geneva. And I started working there. And then after a few years, my boss left to go to Singapore, and I went with my next boss to Barclays Bank in Geneva and worked there for about four years from 1998 to around, oh, let's say 2001. And then I was recruited from Barclays to UBS by a headhunting firm in London, and I started working as the head of business development uh, for North America out of Geneva, Switzerland for UBS. All right, so you, so you have a lot of experience in uh, banking and finance and uh, working in, in the, um, the depths of, of what we would call big banking. So let's turn to the story itself uh, that, that's turned into what I think is, is honestly, this is uh, probably one of the best corporate crime books uh, ever written. It's just a fantastic story. So let's get into this story it, itself. Uh, as I put in the intro, there was some concern on your part that maybe um, UBS was going to be seeking fall guys or gals for uh, their activities. To bring us into this case, what was happening? Well, really what happened here is, and your audience, it's a, it's a complicated sort of web of information that's important to understand the background so you get a feel for it and just don't lash out and make generalized comments. Great. So first and foremost, in Switzerland, Swiss bank secrecy is part of their constitution under Article uh, 47 in 1934. So that's, um, that's a fact. But why did it start? It started because when the Third Reich came to power in Germany under Adolf Hitler in 1933, they said that if you move any money out of the country, you will be shot. 
that's, that's a fact. Switzerland countered and said, we're going to put Article 47 in place to counter that and say, we will never disclose the identity of any client that puts money in our country. Okay, so it made sense. Now, that was 1934. The world was a different place then. After the war, obviously, uh, cross-border business bloomed. Um, people were doing businesses in other currencies, other countries, and so on and so forth. So what happened was uh, Swiss bank secrecy, like attorney-client privilege or medical uh, privacy, you understand that it made sense that you keep this kind of information confidential. Unfortunately, it was abused and taken to such an extent where the political stability and economic stability of Switzerland was uh, utilized for nefarious acts. So you got in uh, the drug dealers, you had in the the um, terrorist financing, insider trading, bribery, extortion, and so on and so forth, as well as intelligence agencies using Switzerland as a piggy bank to do their illegal business. Um, one um, story comes to mind for your audience, which would be Iran-Contra. Iran-Contra, Switzerland was at the center of laundering money to the Contras and Iranians to do this uh, illegal business. So. I worked in this industry in so much as in Switzerland, it was a legal business. It was a bit of a gray area when they told us you should go to the United States and see existing and potential clients because we weren't licensed to sell products or investments in the United States because we were in an offshore jurisdiction. Now, this had been going on before I was born, but also I was a part of it. I was in the middle of this, and it started to get a little bit um, – uh, strenuous because what was happening is they were telling us to do things that really didn't make us feel comfortable. And what it was was take encrypted laptops to the U.S., which I refused to do. And they were telling us to do other uh, training methods to avoid detection in the U.S. and lie on immigration forms, which I refused to do. And really what it came down to was I knew enough about the way in which the business was done. And then one day a colleague brought to me a three-page document from our intranet. Well, the UBS intranet is massive, and you need to know everything on there technically as an officer of the bank. And I had a $10 million signature power, so I had a significant um, responsibility and commitment to the firm and to the clients. Well, what happened was this three-page document that was brought to my attention contradicted everything they were telling us to do meaning going to the U.S. and seeing clients that said you can't go to the U.S., you can't do account opening forms, you can't sell products, you can't do any of these things. So in essence, what they were saying is one thing, and in the background, another thing. And that document, the three-page document, which is in my book, Lucifer's Banker, uh, clearly states that, one, this was sort of a setup. So the bank was protected, but the clients weren't protected, the colleagues weren't protected, and the shareholders were not protected. So this was really a, a matter of greed for the bank, and they weren't able to divorce itself from this business. They just kept wanting to make the money from it. So that was really what it came down to. And I challenged management on it, and ultimately I resigned from the bank when they wouldn't answer me. So this was a heads they win, tails you lose kind of a CYA document, I'm guessing? Absolutely correct, spot on. Okay. So, so when you resigned, uh, you then, um, uh, but you had a, a lot of information and a lot of knowledge about what was going on and, and, a, and uh, the substance of that was that there were a lot of people in the United States who were uh, still using uh, this uh, Swiss banking system in order to evade uh, taxes at this point. And if I have the story right, uh, your information helped expose 19 thousand American names, I don't know if those are individuals or collected entities or how that how that stacks up, uh, that appeared to be hiding money from the IRS. Did did you tell us how, how it is that you came, though, to the decision to say, wow, I, maybe I should go uh, turn whistleblower in this case? Well, I, initially, as I said, I, I saw this three-page document, which I went to the head of the department, who actually blew me off and didn't want to uh, ruffle any feathers. So we almost got in the fisticuffs over that. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're putting everybody at risk here. This is not right. So I immediately gave it to some of my colleagues, senior colleagues. And then I sent an email to the head of legal and the head of compliance, two different departments. And I voiced my concern and attached the three-page document. 
And then I printed this off and then sent it to both of them in interoffice mail. So I was documenting and, and um, putting the material out there so no one could deny it wasn't out there. So I did that for one month, no answer. I did it a second month, no answer. I did it a third month, there was no answer. And at that point, that's when I started taking documents out of the bank and uh, storing them outside of Switzerland in France. Uh, so that I was protected if anyone accused me of saying, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. I had the documents to prove it. Now, then I resigned from the bank. I resigned in October of 2005. Now, I started the whistleblowing in March of 05. Now, this was a year and a half before the whistleblowing law in America was passed by Congress. So people say, well, you just did it for the money. No, I didn't because I started my whistleblowing long before the law was even passed. So that's an important fact for your audience to understand. Mm -hmm. The second thing is I then took the three internal UBS whistleblowing policies that they wrote, and I attached my three-page document and the information I sent to UBS Legal and UBS Compliance, and I sent it to the board of directors of the bank and said, now it's your problem. I'm, I'm a whistleblower internally. I'm telling you, and you need to do something about it. Well, that caused a huge problem for the bank because now they knew they were on a stick for this extensive legal, illegal conduct. Then they called an investigation. That investigation was just a sandbag job, and they covered it up again. So the board of directors of the bank covered up the largest and longest-running tax fraud in the world. So at that point, I had no choice but to then go to the United States government, my own government, and tell them about this. But unfortunately, the U.S. government was a part of it. They were knee-deep in it. And I can tell you why this is so damning is because the Department of Justice doesn't like whistleblowers, number one, because it makes them look like the fools they are. The second thing is, if they were so good, why didn't they uncover it? Why would it take a single courageous whistleblower to come forward and expose the largest and longest running tax fraud in the world? And they were, they were oblivious to this? No, they were a part of it, as I said. So this really was the problem. And then I knew that the DOJ was so hostile towards me, and I had to go to the SEC, the IRS, and the U.S. Senate. And if you go onto my website, luciferspanker.com, you'll see under the UBS scandal, there are countless documents of the Senate hearings and uh, GAO reports and so on and so forth that prove what I was saying was correct. And the government really didn't want to get involved in this because as I said, a lot of these people were involved, CEOs, billionaires, politicians, celebrities, sports stars. And this is what happened. It is ingrained in America, 19,000 rich Americans where the minimum account size was a million dollars had this at UBS in Switzerland. All right. So, Brad, what I'm hearing here, though, is, you know, whether the DOJ was uh, they didn't want to either look like fools uh, or, or inept or something like that. But you also mentioned earlier that intelligence agencies had been known through the Iran-Contra example. Uh, we can assume that's not a one off, but but that there was a. Uh, um, there's possibly government involvement here at some level. So so I want to circle back around to that. But before we uh, get there. Let's talk now um, about how this case really started to come out. What you're describing was that because it's encoded in the Swiss constitution, this banking secrecy, you're taking extraordinary risk here, both with the Swiss government authorities, and now you're making it sound like also at least the U.S. Department of Justice uh, authorities as well. That, that really sounds rock in a hard place. Again, why, why did, do I have that right? And if so, why did you do this? Well, you're absolutely correct. Uh, but th the main thing was the DOJ, I asked them for immunity. They declined. I asked them for a subpoena, a simple subpoena, which takes a matter of minutes to issue. And they refused because they thought, you know, we're not going to work with this guy. They were being very hostile. So I said, OK, you're not going to do that. Now, I can't give you names unless you give me a subpoena because I would go to jail in Switzerland where it's a crime to expose your clients, which I did not do. Mm -hmm. The only client I exposed was a client that was making illegal oil sales with Saddam Hussein, who had $420 million in six numbered accounts, who lived in a $50 million condo in New York City. Now, his name was Abdul Aziz Abbas, and he's in my book. And you can see the account numbers there, and you see the entire information on this gentleman. The DOJ did nothing about this person, nothing, because he was best friends with Ray Kelly, the 
commissioner of the police department, and he was friends with Rudy Giuliani in New York. So you can see that there was political ties to this person, and most likely he was involved with the CIA because he was doing illegal oil sales with Saddam Hussein. So this in of itself was so damning. But then I went to the U.S. Senate, and they were happy to give me a subpoena. So by getting the subpoena from the U.S. Senate, I was insulated from prosecution in Switzerland, but I wasn't insulated from prosecution by the DOJ, who were furious that I, I left them and then involved other agencies like the Senate, the SEC, and the IRS. Now, let's, let's talk about this, because there, there's just so much smoke here. I, I know there's fire down here somewhere. Your information ended up exposing those 19,000 American names we talked about. Uh, let's unpack this. How many of those names were actually turned over to the IRS? Well, this is the problem. What we had and what we learned later as a result of WikiLeaks, and it's on my website again, mm -hmm. uh, luciferspanker.com, there is, um, ironically, um, Afton Posten is a Norwegian newspaper that exposed a one-page CIA cable. And that cable showed that Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State had secret meetings with the Swiss to settle the UBS case for political reasons. Hmm. Now, that's very dangerous. Yes, exactly. So what we have here is a secretary of state who claims to be so above board, but yet was having secret meetings and negotiating only 4,500 names out of 19,000, Chris. Now, Chris, that's a 75% failure rate. If you fail 75% of the time at your job or any of your listeners fail 75% of the time, they'd be fired. Well, so, uh, it goes beyond the failure. Who picked those names and left the other ones off? Well, then you get into the more deep questions. Exactly correct. How were they selected? Did Hillary pick them? Did UBS pick them? Who was, who was selected and why? And why wouldn't you get all 19,000 names, Chris? You know, five people rob a bank, you only get one person? No, you get all five. And this was going on for decades. So the very fact that she made a deal and negotiated 25% of the names and how they were selected, as you rightly point out, is really troubling. And you've actually, in, in effect, you've cheated 300 million Americans. Yeah, Brad, I wanna to get to, I mean, this is just, a, here's where the sausage is being made. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have this part that uh, you wrote here is just, uh, this is just astonishing to me and that this didn't really come out more fully in the last election cycle, but it's that prior to Clinton's Hillary Clinton's deal with the Swiss, that secret deal, UBS had only seen fit to contribute sixty thousand dollars to the Clinton Foundation. You wrote an amount that wouldn't even cover the bank's annual parking tickets, but that afterwards the Clinton Foundation's cash registers rang up six hundred thousand dollars in UBS gifts, and the bank also then decided to partner with the foundation on inner city development programs, issuing a thirty-two million dollar loan at very reasonable rates, and oh. Suddenly, the UBS also thought Bill Clinton would make a very fine paid speaker about global affairs, so they paid him $1.52 million for a series of fireside chats with the bank's wealth management chief executive, Bob McCann. It was Bill Clinton's biggest payday since leaving the office of the presidency. Brad, I got to tell you, that, that doesn't smell real good over here from where I'm sitting. Well, let me tell you something. Not only does it stink to high heaven, but it shows the ingrained corruption of the Clinton family and the foundation. They're mm -hmm. inter inextricably linked. You can't divorce yourselves from both. They're the alter ego of one another. And they use it as a piggy bank to curry favor with foreign governments and get these funds. Now, ironically, we found out just recently, a few months ago, after the election, that, geez, the Swiss government gave $500,000 to the Clinton Foundation while they were negotiating the settlement with UBS. Oh, come on. <laughs> I, oh, it's on my website. You can go check the article. Go on to my website. You'll see that this is what was going on. So how is it possible that you would be involved in such a nefarious act and a conflict and you violated your oath to the U.S. Constitution? That's an impeachable offense. It, it, it's just it's astonishing to me. And so, um, you know, the, the subtext of all of this, which is really is that, you know, it's kind of crime pays, but but it actually it's that we have we entered a period of what you're calling no fault corporate crime enforcement. I, I think it began a long time ago, but under Holder, it became a real art form. So in this case um, where UBS was eventually fined 780 million for helping those U.S. citizens evade the taxes. 
what kind of a, in terms of the, what sort of a penalty was that? Was that several hundred percent of their ill-gotten gains? Or, uh, you know, tell me what kind of a, what kind of a slap was that? Well, for your audience, it's very simple, the math. They, the Department of Justice took an eight-year window, if you will, from 2000 to 2008, uh, 2007, pardon me. That's an eight-year window. That eight-year window, we made about $200 million a year in profits. Those numbers came from me, were given to the Justice Department, and that was in the deferred prosecution. By the way, the bank wasn't prosecuted. They got a deferred prosecution and paid $780 million. But really, if you run the numbers, $200 million of the 780 went to the SEC. So they really fined them $580 million. And they were making $200 million a year for an eight-year period. So the quick math tells you that's $1.6 billion, Chris. Mm-hmm. where the billion dollars go? Just to make the U.S. taxpayer whole. Forget about fines, penalties, and interest. Then UBS claimed they couldn't afford to pay because they had hard times. They accepted $5 billion from AIG, which was taxpayer money. So we were laundering money through AIG to pay UBS, and they claimed they couldn't pay the fine. The political forces at bay at the time fixed it. The Barack Obama presidency is tainted and corrupt. And furthermore, Eric Holder in private practice represented UBS at Covington and Burling. Hillary Clinton had secret meetings with Swiss and sent two Chinese Ugar Guantanamo detainees to Switzerland to settle the case. Barack Obama, who was Senator Obama, was on the Senate committee investigating UBS, but never attended one meeting. Not one. They were investigating UBS, but at the same time, he accepted millions of dollars from UBS for his presidential campaign. That is an impeachable offense. He violated his oath to the Constitution. He betrayed the American people, and you don't see any media outlet talking about this. Not one. Indeed, we don't. And so I, I want to turn to what is, I'm sure, the, the darkest portion of this story for you was, was you being prosecuted. And uh, I'm not aware of anybody else in this entire story being prosecuted or even losing their job. Maybe I have that wrong. But uh, what happened to you? What was the what was the specifics of the case? Well, they they gave all of my bosses above me secret non-prosecution agreements. Each one of them got a secret non-prosecution agreement. And even when the head of the private bank, Raul Weil, was indicted and then called a fugitive three months later, a few years later, after 2009, when that happened, he went to Italy and he was uh, arrested on an Interpol arrest warrant where he was a fugitive. Well, now the U.S. was in big trouble because they had to put on this sham case in Florida. Now, when he was arrested and extradited to Florida, this is the head of the private bank for UBS. I gave that name to them. That's how they indicted him. But it was just a, a show maneuver. So when the trial came up, they never called me to testify, not once. They called all of my bosses who got secret non-prosecution agreements, and he was acquitted in about 30 minutes because the whistleblower wasn't able to testify in that case. Wasn't able to? No. (laughs) No, they didn't call me. They didn't want me me at the trial. And they, they screwed up the case. So once again, 300 million Americans plus got screwed by the corrupt Department of Justice. They're not about justice. They're about protecting themselves, trying to take credit, and making everyone else um, listen to what they say the story is. But unfortunately, now I've told my story in the book, and it's so compelling. And if you think of it this way, your audience is, is quite intelligent. We remember the financial crisis of 2008. It was devastating. And so many people lost their jobs, lost their homes, and so forth. In the entire financial crisis, there was not one banker to go to jail. The only banker to go to jail was the UBS whistleblower who exposed the largest and longest running tax fraud in the world. And, and the substance of the case against you was that they said, uh, if I have this right, um, that you had failed to be forthcoming about your clients, specifically one of them. And, um, and uh, I, I believe uh, Key Kevin, it was Kevin Downing who was prosecuting this, said, quote, with regard to whistleblowers, those who seek to be treated as true whistleblowers need to know they must come in early and give complete and truthful disclosures. Mr. Birkenfeld did not come in and give complete and truthful disclosures. Therefore, he is not entitled to whistleblower status. How do you respond? 
Well, he's a fraud, and that's a lie. He lied to the Senate, and he lied to, and his colleagues lied to the Senate, and he lied to a federal judge in Florida who is, is as corrupt as the Department of Justice. The fact of the matter is, they knew I could not give names until I had a subpoena. UBS said the same thing. We cannot give names. I said the same thing. The moment I went to the Senate, I gave testimony to the Senate after the subpoena and gave all the names. And Igor Lenikoff was in there. And the Senate shared the information with the DOJ, and they used that information to indict me. So they're, they're, they're lying. It's a flat-out lie. And it's even worse. To this day, Chris, to this very day, the testimony I gave almost a decade ago to the Senate, under oath, they won't give me my own testimony. Really? Won't give it to me. Because you know why? Because the information I gave about Alenikoff is in there. I gave a Le Igor Alenikoff to them, and they had that information. And they even sent me an email saying, oh, we forgot about Kevin Costner. We, no, we forgot about Igor Alenikoff, but we remember Kevin Costner. Oh, well, that's nice. How hmm. did that work out? Hmm. So you see that they were all in bed together to bury this because they all look like idiots. And I exposed the whole scandal, which they were a part of, because now they were scrambling for a scapegoat. And that was me. Right. And, and just to just so people get the complete picture, the prosecutor at the time uh, out of the DOJ was uh, Kevin Downing, who, who is now hold, hold on to your seats, people. Uh, an attorney for Miller and Chevalier, uh, a Washington, D.C. white shoe firm specializing in tax law, white collar crime, and advising global businesses on government enforcement and compliance. What a revolving door. I mean, it just uh, between Eric Holder and on and on. I mean, th this is a really hard impression for me to shake and for my listeners, which is that there is just this revolving door. They all protect each other. They commit massive crimes and the laws don't seem to apply to them. In some respects, to get, you know, this isn't a political statement, but an observation, this was the, the, the odor that Hillary was carrying with her saying, trust me, um, I'm electable, I'll take care of you. But we all know that the Clinton Foundation, what we saw of it, it was just a, a pay for pay play scheme, um, that there's just massive institutionalized fraud and corruption ongoing. Is this, is this a fair characterization? When did it start? And where, where do we, what, what's, our, what's our hope in this story? Well, the, the, the good thing is, is that um, I'm out and I published my book, Lucifer's Banker. I put a website together, luciferbanker.com. Mm -hmm. I'm publishing my book in multiple foreign languages and lecturing around the world to educate the people, to show how corrupt the Department of Justice is, to show that there's this revolving door where Kevin Downing leaves the Department of Justice, goes to Miller and Chevalier, and is defending the people he should have prosecuted. This is outrageous. Why isn't there a Senate hearing on this? Why aren't I called in to testify in public and expose all of it? Because then you're going to have a lot of rich contributors and CEOs and politicians themselves say, we can't have him speak in public under oath because it'll expose us for what we are, frauds. Well, absolutely. So, so let me just build, you know, it took me about a minute to assemble a, a, a list of crimes of UBS. So, so you're... In, it was 2009, as a consequence of your actions, UBS was fined that $780 million. Then in 2012, UBS is fined $1.5 billion, this time for the LIBOR scandal. 2015, fined $545 million for foreign exchange manipulation. Listen, I, I take two things from this, Brad, uh, from that list. First uh, is that uh, UBS has learned nothing except that crime does pay. Um, and the second is that uh, the big banks are busy manipulating pretty much every market, no matter how large uh, at this point in time. Uh, again, are those fair sort of assessments at this point? It's an understatement, actually, Chris, because, you know, I've only put the top 10 UBS funds on my website under the UBS scandal. And the very fact that you just write a check, and I, I coined the phrase, aptly named, it's political prostitution. The politicians just have these wonderful press conferences at the DOJ, and say, we got all this money, we have all this, but nobody goes to jail. So number one, here's the problem with this. So when you find UBS, what your audience must realize is very simple. UBS is a Swiss bank. So that means they write it off on their taxes. So then that means the Swiss taxpayers uh, carry the burden. That's the first thing. The second thing is 
go look at the millions and millions of dollars in legal fees to defend this criminal conduct. Then the UBS shareholders pick up that tab. Oh, that's nice. So you have UBS shareholders, Swiss citizens, picking up the tab for bankers who just keep doing their business, and they walk away. How is this possible? Then the U.S. government, oh, they get a happy face for the day, meaning what they've done is they set an incredibly bad precedent and zero deterrence. Because what they're saying is, oh, if you get caught again, you just write a check. Oh, you might have to add five or ten million to that check, and you just keep doing the business you're doing. And the 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 pathetic prosecutors at the Department of Justice say, oh, see, we got a check and we can put it on our resume saying we got two hundred million from this bank for doing illegal conduct. Yeah, but you've screwed the American people. It's outrageous. It is outrageous, and it, and it continues on. And so uh, um, to round this out. I'm really glad to have you on because maybe you can shed light on this. Uh, we we tracked and, and we, we were uh, pretty carefully looking at what happened with the Panama Papers when they came out, uh, that giant dump uh, that, that came out uh, from that um, Mosaic of, uh, file dump. And uh, I was a little surprised, well, maybe not, but just a little surprised at how quickly that story disappeared from the news cycle. And in searching afterwards, there are independent analysts who've, who've dug through that trove and uncovered what appears to be a massive evasion and laundering scheme. Uh, you talk about, you know, is the DOJ worried about appearing foolish or, or complicit or incompetent? I mean, that to me looked like, again, giant silver platter. Here's a, here's a web of, of uh, shell companies that are clearly designed to uh, hide wealth from authorities and uh, partners, spouses, from, from legal, any sort of legal oversight. That went away pretty quickly. Is that an unfair um, observation of mine? No, it's, it is a very good observation. It's very uh, to the point. And the point we have with the Panama Papers is very simple. Why is it that they said there was an anonymous whistleblower, which it could be, but 11.4 million documents, you have to understand how many documents that is to fill a room. It's massive. Now, no thumb drive is going to hold that amount on there. So this was clearly an intelligence breach. Some intelligence agency hacked this and did it for a purpose to expose some of the enemies, let's say, of the U.S., whether it's Putin or Pakistan or Venezuela and that's what happened. And, and there was Cameron who was collateral damage because this was so massive. And, and in my opinion, I gave an interview in Munich, Germany on this. And I said, yeah, it was the CIA that pulled this off because what they did was they tried to get in there to use this information to threaten other people. For instance, if I get information and I destroy somebody, let's say yourself in politics, I go to the next person and say, see what I did to Chris? So you better play ball with me or I'm going to expose you. And it's more of about a leverage game of extortion. And I'm convinced that's what this is because it's just, it doesn't make sense. There's an anonymous whistleblower, 11.4 million documents, and everybody who was announced in the initial leak was an enemy of the U.S. How is that possible? Yeah, it didn't make sense to me either. That was one of our observations, like this really stinks to high heaven. Um, but it didn't seem to have a huge impact, I guess, it, it, uh, it, except unless it was a chilling sort of, a, you know, as you say, a, a message sent, uh, a shot across the bow. And, and on that front, uh, it's pretty clear to me that um, your particular case as a whistleblower uh, was really designed by the Department of Justice to send a chilling message to other whistleblowers. So under Obama, who I know a lot of people think was this progressive, suave uh, person they, that, that they really admire, his... Uh, uh, he was probably the most hostile president I'm aware of to whistleblowers. Um, and uh, it seems to me like your case was, if anything, uh, the equivalent of, of the uh, Panama Paper dump. It's like, hey, shot across the bow, don't, uh, don't be a whistleblower. We're going to make your life very miserable if you do. Again, unfair or fair? Well, you're absolutely correct. And it goes even deeper than that. And Barack Obama has defrauded the American people. I will debate this gentleman at any city at any time on this issue. But obviously he wouldn't do that because I would expose him for what he is, the fraud I say he is. That's the first thing. The second thing is he violated his oath to the Constitution when he never attended those hearings at the U.S. Senate, in which he is an active member at the time. Third, his cabinet was so flawed 
between Eric Holder, who represented UBS, Hillary Clinton, who did a secret deal with the Swiss, Tim Geithner, who didn't pay his own taxes, the Treasury Secretary didn't pay his own taxes and admitted it. <laughs> so this is, this is the cast of clowns you had in the Obama circus. Uh-huh. And I can tell you, you know, everybody wants to say he was such a great president and this and that. And look, I, I'm not going to say one way or another. I'm just stating fact. And I think if at any time you treat the American people, you should be removed from office immediately, period. End of story. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, <clears throat> just to, um, I agree totally. And uh, uh, you have a, a an interesting uh, uh, piece in the book, which is about how on August 2009, on that first Sunday after you were sentenced uh, in, in prison, at the Farm Neck Golf Club in Martha's Vineyard, President Obama uh, was playing golf that day, and his partner was Robert Wolf, chairman of UBS Americas. Uh, and you wrote, I'm sure it was a fine day of patter and play guarded by a throng of Secret Service agents, and I wondered if Obama and Wolf had high-fived over my downfall or maybe sent a good job text to the sentencing judge. I'll never know, because much like Swiss bankers, Secret Service agents don't talk. Uh, it, it, that does seem like a little wink from, from the, from the matrix as it were like, Hey, you know, this is how we play. This is how the game is played. Well, that's exactly right. And, and, and Barack Obama, um, was actually more hostile towards whistleblowers than any other presidents combined. And in my case, in particular with this UBS case, how, how interesting that the fact of the matter is, is that you were in bed with the big bank period. And this is something that was so dangerous because Robert Wolf was then appointed by the president to two of his committees, mm. and, and he was a frequent visitor of the White House. Why would you do such a thing? Why was this something that was never disclosed clearly, and the president was never grilled on this by the, by the media in the uh, White House? I mean, this was just left to the wayside. So it just goes to show you, all the way from the president down, you can't trust these people. It's like anything. If, if you have a spousal relationship and you cheat once, you'll cheat a thousand times. That's the same with President Obama. You cheated the American people once, God only knows how many other times he cheated us. And think of it this way. Take a more current event with President Obama. When he paid $1.4 billion in cash to the state of Iran. Right. Now, the money wasn't wired. It was sent in cash on a private jet from where else? Geneva, Switzerland. So I guess uh, President Obama has access to bank accounts in Geneva where he pulled the money from? Is that <laughs> where the money came from? I mean, this is outrageous. Yeah. This, is, and this is incredible. And what I did, I sent my book, Lucifer's Banker, by FedEx to every member of Congress before the election, as well as to the president and the attorney general and the secretary of state, John Kerry. I didn't get one response from one Democrat, not one. But I got three letters from three Republican uh, congressmen. And that, that's very telling. The fact that I had written a letter to the president in the book, which is on my website, and he didn't respond, so he's a busy guy. But I said, what are you going to do to fix this? Why is this that you cheated the American people? Why aren't you doing something about it? And the very fact that senators and Congress people who represent us, the people, don't act on this. This is... This just shows how ridiculous the whole system is. Absolutely, absolutely. And while I have you, I have to ask a question. This is a, a very narrow question. You may not have any insight into this, um, but one of the markets that uh, my followers uh, look at pretty closely is, are the precious metals markets. Um, excuse me, I mean, that's going to get edited out. Um, are the precious metals markets, and uh, do you have any insights, to, any, any idea that maybe those would be uh, free from, from the sort of manipulation and corruption that seems to be uh, discovered everywhere else in the financial landscape? The problem with the U.S. government is they're so clueless about investigating those types of crimes. And I was working with several clients, not my clients, but several other clients, and we looked at the gold manipulation by UBS. Gold is traded around the world through certain time zones, Hong Kong, Dubai, London, mm-hmm. and New York. And you can see the amount of money that they trade in gold is staggering. This needs an investigation immediately into the trading practices of gold. But here's the problem. If you indict UBS, that's like indicting the Swiss government because the Swiss government and UBS are one and the same. Mm. And I'll give you an even better example. Back in 2004, UBS, the largest bank in the world, 
at the time, was sending illegal wire transfers of millions of dollars to Cuba, Libya, and Iran. This is 2004. Hmm. So Cuba, Libya, and Iran. The U.S. government comes in and finds them $100 million, and no one goes to jail. Now, how do you pull that number out of thin air, $100 million. Sounds nice, sounds sexy, but how do you calculate that? Where did you come up with that number? That's the first thing. The second more troubling thing is Cuba, Libya, and Iran in 2004, who represented the U.S. interests in those countries? Switzerland. So the Swiss government had to know what UBS was up to, but yet they're violating our own sanctions that we set up to say you can't deal with these three countries, but you represent us in those three countries. This is absolutely madness. Hmm. Why is no one talking about this? Why isn't anyone doing anything about this? And they continue, as you rightly point out, to break the law in various businesses, in various countries around the world, and it's business as usual. Well, it sounds, uh, you know, this isn't bankers acting badly. This is uh, a bankers in bed with the government. And, of course, this is uh, something that's been going on ever since the Federal Reserve was chartered in 1913. Um, and it's been growing and building. But what I'm getting a sense of here is, is uh, you know, I track the Federal Reserve very closely as a proxy for all of the central banks, but they're all in the same game, which is they're serial bubble blowers. They've been financializing everything, creating massive, massive uh, amounts of money out of thin air. Everybody's sort of been feasting around that. It really feels like a party gone bad. Um, and, uh, and in some respects, it almost feels like everybody's grabbing as much as they can where nothing matters anymore. Country loyalty doesn't exist. Honor doesn't exist. Um, doing right from wrong, people don't seem to remember what that is anymore. Uh, you know, laws are for little people, and all of this is is starting to boil over. And that sense of injustice is being felt in the voters and the voting populace. And of course, bringing these stories to light is really important. I, I really, uh, Brad, what you've done is just absolutely fantastic. It's amazing. It needed to be done, and um, I'll do everything I can to help get that message out. Because uh, the first thing that needs to happen is we have to understand what the game is and how it's being played. There's no justice here. There's no right from wrong. There's just corruption at this point. Well, well, you're absolutely correct. And your audience understands this. And I hope your audience can spread the word and, uh, and, and look at my website. And if they'd like to buy the book, certainly that's nice because it'll tell a story that's so riveting and it's factual because it's backed up with documents on my website. So I, I, I challenge anyone in politics, anyone, if you'd like to debate this issue, I will show up. But I've got no takers. Why? Because nobody wants to go down this path because it's, you know, be careful what you wish for. These people are part of the problem, not part of the solution. And they keep telling us that they're going to pass laws and regulations. It doesn't work because you have a political justice department that does nothing except they hold press conferences and tell you how great they are. Ask yourself this, all the fines that the DOJ has, has levied, where does that money go? Do we have a full accounting of that money? And where does it go? I, I, I bet do. we don't. <laughs> right. Well, what's it go? The DOJ bingo parlor fund? I mean, you know, we need a third party accounting of this and call them into Senate hearings. Call me in. I hope your audience goes to your senators and say, look, you need hearings on this issue, and Mr. Birkenfeld should be called in to testify under oath. I'd show up there tomorrow if I was called. And now we'll get to the truth. We'll get to the bottom of this so the American people can stop stealing, they're getting screwed, and they don't get the truth. This is a real problem. And just this matter I said about the DOJ with all the fines, where is that money going? I mean, how do we know they're not spending it? How do they know they're just not buying whatever they feel? Where is the oversight? Where is the accountability? And that's the key word for me is accountability. Obviously, uh, without accountability, you get nothing. Nothing changes. And uh, we've got moral hazard baked into the system. But also this crime does pay mentality. Clearly it pays. And it won't change without accountability. Fines do nothing. So we have to get back to accountability or we have to just accept that we live in an increasingly rapacious system that is going to um, lie, cheat, steal, thieve, uh, from the everybody for the benefit of the few. That's that's the system. It needs changing. Uh, we've been talking with Brad Birkenfeld, author of Lucifer's Banker, the untold story of how I destroyed Swiss bank secrecy. Brad, one more time, your website so people can find you. It's www.lucifersbanker.com. 
and there's some fantastic documents in there under the UBS scandal. I think your audience will really enjoy it, and uh, I really just want to educate the American people and show them how they're getting uh, ripped off by their own government. Well, thank you for that, and also for writing what is probably the best corporate crime book written that I, I've read so far. It's just fantastic. It's a really li riveting tale, and, and maddening, too, if I can put that in there, because it's just so blatantly obvious what's going on. We need these stories to get out. Brad, thank you so much for your time today, and mostly for doing what you've done and uh, for writing this book. Well, Chris, thank you for having me on, and uh, I hope your audience enjoys the book and um, look forward to coming back on your show at some point. Thank you. I'd love to have you back.